chapter number 2, and, and can I ask for those saints of God, if y'all wouldn't mind praying for me tonight, and um, I would surely covet your prayers in a mighty way, because I feel like within my heart that there's a battle going on inside this church tonight, and I want to see God wrought the victory tonight, and, um, and I don't know if anybody else feels that. But I sure do tonight, and it may be me, I don't know, but I feel like there's a struggle taking place inside the recesses of this wall, the four walls we've got here tonight, and I'm just going to plead the blood on it, that's exactly what I'm going to do, and, and uh, we're just going to give it to the Lord, and like we looked at the other night, and the Lord wrought a great victory, and I'm just going to claim that tonight. Song of Solomon, chapter number two, and I'm going to read the entirety of the chapter, it's just 17 verses. But um, we will key in on a thought. Verse number one says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Hmm. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand does embrace me. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the fields, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills, my beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall and looketh forth at the windows, shewing himself through the lattice. Oh, if we would just get a peek of Jesus tonight. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth for the time of the singing of the birds is come. The voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Oh, my dove, thou art the cleft of the rocks. In the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. For sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Take up the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine, for our vines have tender grapes. My beloved, he is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies until the day break and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, to be like a roe or a young heart upon the mountain of Bether. Can we pray? Dearly Father, I rejoice again just one more time. Lord, just to read your word. Lord, we're so blessed. Lord, to have the eyesight. Lord, just to be able to handle the word of God. Lord, to be able to come to the house of God just one more time. And Lord, as we come to you, we're just going to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise for what you're doing here tonight. Lord, I believe you're wanting to do something. Lord, I'm asking this church, the saints of God, Lord, we want to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Lord, we don't want to quench or grieve you. And so, Lord, I'd ask that you'd empty this old vessel. And Lord, if there's anything that's between you and I, Lord, I'd pray that you'd forgive me of my trespasses and purge me, I pray, of my iniquities. Lord, we want to be used by you tonight. And Lord, it seems like there's a somberness set upon this service. Here tonight, Lord, I just want to ask you, Lord, would you put a holy hush on this place? Lord, we're just going to stand back. Lord, we're going to ask you to do the work now tonight. Lord, if I do it, it won't stay. But, Lord, if you do it, it'll work. And, Lord, I pray you touch the hearts of your people. Lord, no doubt inside this wall, Lord, there's different needs, different situations, different burdens. But, Lord, in the midst of all the challenges, Lord, there's victory. So, Lord, as we come to you, Lord, we're asking that you move amongst the hearts of your people just one more time. 
And Lord, if there's anybody here lost tonight, oh Lord, I pray that this would be the glad night that that individual would be birthed in the family of God. Lord, if there's somebody wayward, Lord, I'm glad, just like the prodigal son, Lord, there's not a far, a far country too far for you. And Lord, I pray that that prodigal would come home. And Lord, I'd ask that you would just help us here. Lord, would you settle me in? Lord, would you just calm my nerves? And Lord, would you just use me? Lord, I pray you'd touch this old vessel of clay just one more time. Lord, would you revive your people? Lord, God, would you rend the heavens? Lord, would you meet with us here tonight? Lord, we do love you. Lord, I thank you for this avenue of prayer. Lord, I feel like I could pray and talk to you for an hour tonight. Longer, but Lord, we'll ask this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated. I love the book of Song of Solomon. Probably one of my favorite books out of the Old Testament. And I've read through it quite a few times. I've got quite a few messages out of the book of Song of Solomon that God's given me over the years. And if you keep it in the right context, it's a beautiful book. But there's so many people that has perverted a book that's never meant to be perverted. It's a beautiful story of Christ and the church. And if you just go through and you read and you just ask the Lord to show himself out of the verses, you'll run into Christ numerous times in the book of Song of Solomon. And if you're reading, ever read through the book of Song of Solomon, and one of the things that's there that's opened it up to me when you're reading through it is that when you come across the word beloved, it's her uh, speaking to him. And when he says, my love, that's him speaking to her. Boy, there's something I like, and it goes back, and if you just take the Song of Solomon and you just read it very slowly, and you see where it transitions to where he's speaking and then she's speaking and how they communicate back and forth and how we get to chapter number 2, and it comes across in verse number 10, and it says this, or verse number 8, and it says, The voice of my beloved. And I want to look at that thought tonight with the help of God. And it's a message I haven't preached in quite a while. But I want to look at a thought here tonight. Behold, what a voice God has. Behold, what a voice God has. And you say, does God have a voice? Oh, sure he's got a voice. And there's some voices that I like to hear that I'm very prudent to. And I like to listen to them and, and, and listen to them daily. I like to listen to my children. I get up in the morning now, uh, since Brian has changed my schedule, I get up before they do, and I leave the house before they get up. But usually it was they were getting up before Daddy did, and I'd listen upstairs, and I would listen to hear the sounds of my children and their sisters, and they get along pretty well, and there's moments that they have, but I, I listen sometimes just to hear their voice, and boy, what rejoicing it is in the morning, and when you come through a night of rest, and you hear that both of your children are up walking around the house and you can hear their voice and I love to hear that voice. I love to hear my wife's voice sometimes. Say amen right there. But, uh, but my, my wife's voice is something I like to hear and there's nothing like my wife's voice. And there's, uh, I like to hear her talk to me and I like for her to tell me I love you and I like to hear her talk to me in a and that endearment and that in, in intimate times and how she communicates to me and her names that she has for me. I like to listen to that. I love to hear my mama's voice just one more time. Boy, I'd listen to my mama's voice and I've got it on recording. Every now and then. Oh, I go back. Just listen to my mama. Just one more time. There's nothing like it. It never failed when I left my mama at the nursing home. And my mama would always say before I left, never without fail, Dr. Winterman, never without fail. My mama would always tell me how proud she was of me. And I've often wondered, Mom, how could you be proud of me some of the times I've let you down? And even in the midst of my times of letting her down, 
He'd always say, son, I want you to know I'm proud of what you've become. And to hear my mama's voice just one more time. Oh, it's going to be a day because my mama's in heaven. And uh, one of these days, glorious days, I'm going to hear her voice another time. It won't be that weak voice of Parkinson's disease. And it'll be a strong voice, amen. But most of all, I like to hear God's voice. And uh, there's nothing like it. And boy, I'm telling you, you say, does God speak to his people? Oh, yes. Oh, does he ever speak to his people? And you say, audibly, it's much clearer than that. And uh, she was right as we were coming through. She said, behold, the voice of my beloved. And does God have a voice? Oh, yes. We can go to Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 3. And God says, let there be light. And he spoke this whole world into existence. And he said, let there be light. And there was light. And boy, we can go through and see where Moses was at the burning bush. And he come across Jehovah and he, was, he met the Lord in that burning bush. And he told Moses to take his shoes off his feet for he stands on holy ground. Boy, how he spoke to Moses in the burning bush. And how he says, tell him, I am that I am has sent thee. And boy, that was God's voice. And boy, God does have a voice. And I want to look at that tonight with the help of the Lord. Behold, what a voice God has. What a voice God has. Number one, we see that voice. God has a voice of compassion. Here we see in Song of Solomon chapter number 2 and verse number 10, it says, Behold, my beloved spake and said unto me, Arise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And in your King James Bible, that phrase, my love, my fair one, come away, is only used two times in your King James Bible. And it's used in verse number 10. And if you'll go down to verse number 13, it's used again, my love, my fair one, and come away. And so it's used two times in your King James Bible. And, and so it's pretty significant that God would put it back to back like he did in Song of Solomon. It's not there by accident. And when God says something one time, you listen. But when he says it twice, there's something very important God's trying to get across to us. And he says, my love, my fair one. And that's a voice of compassion. And, and, and it talks about how God is looking at us. And it says, my fair one. And that, that term or uh, what that means, it means this, my fair one. It means to be beautiful. It means to be clear from spot. And boy, if you were to look at me, I'm not the most prettiest thing to look at. Don't say amen right here. It's not a good time to do that. But I tell you, if you were to look on me, I'd never make it on a magazine of, of some of the top 100, whatever they got, sexiest men in the world. I'll never make that list. Say amen. Some of y'all ain't either. <laughs> and so I'm amongst a good company, amen. But I'm telling you, when God looks at you, he says, he says, my love, it means that you're beautiful. You're something and you're free from spot. In other words, God don't see anything in you whatsoever. And, and how do you get beautiful? Well, Song of Solomon, uh, it tells us that it says in Song of Solomon chapter 4, God, I pray you'd help me tonight. It says in verse number or chapter number 4 and verse number 7, it says, Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. In Song of Solomon chapter number 6, verse number 9, it says, My dove, my undefiled, is but one. One. And so when he's looking at us, he don't see what we used to be. He sees us because we've been saved by the grace of God. And when he looks at me, he don't see what I used to be. He sees me covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I was, I love to hunt. It's something I like to do. Don't get to do much of it anymore because of the schedule. And I'm fine with that. And But one day I was hunting and I got some blood that was spilt upon my pant legs and my hunting pants. And, and I was sitting there and I had them still there. And I went back in the woods and that blood was still there and, and I got to playing around with that where that blood was and, and I would take it brother coach and I'd take my pant legs and I would try to crease that blood and you, can I tell you you couldn't crease the blood. It wouldn't tarnish. You couldn't do anything with it. And I got to really studying out that blood. And it, you know what that blood did? It ironed out every wrinkle that was on that pants right there. I couldn't get it off. I couldn't crease it. I couldn't wrinkle it. I couldn't defile it. I couldn't do anything because the blood was applied to my pants. But I'm telling you, it's just same as the same as a child of God. Now, there's sometimes I get aggravated and I get flustered real good. I'm, I don't do good drive and I get road rage sometimes. Y'all know that very well. I don't like tailgaters. I don't like those that get in front of me and slow down. Had one of them tonight, amen. Pulled out in a 55, slowed down to a 35, and I couldn't pass them. I said, sir, if that's all you're going to do, pull over on the side of the road. I says, you're aggravating the fire out of me. Amen. 
And I get flustered and I get mad. I fly off the handle. I've got a short fuse sometimes. And, I mean, you can ask my wife. I mean, I, my, sometimes I, my ears are smoking because I get aggravated sometimes. And it's something that God's helped me with over the years. But every now and then my flesh still rears its ugly head up. I don't know if the devil ever takes notice. I don't think I'm doing enough for the devil to take notice of Robert Jones, and I'll probably admit that, but I've often wondered if there was sometimes I've, I've really just had one of them days and I didn't act right, didn't do right, didn't say something right, I mean, didn't have the right attitude, everything. Come on, we're all that way sometimes. And I've wondered if he didn't go up there and says, Boy, God, uh, Jesus, boy, your son just really done a good one today. God the Father looks over at God's Son. I don't know if this happens or not, but just let me run with this just for a little bit because I like it. Oh, God the Father looks over at God the Son and says, Son, what do you think about that? He looks over at the portals of glory and looks down to where I'm at and he says, Father, are you talking about my beautiful one? Are you talking about my fair one down there? I don't see anything but the blood. Matter of fact, he's so undefiled, he's but one. He's a, he has no spot in him. He's just so beautiful. Boy, I can look at him all day long. And that's what he was saying about this woman. He says, my love, my fair one, and come away. He is looking at her. And boy, if you go to chapter number 1, verse number 5, I believe it was, and she says, I am black but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem. Verse number 6, she says, look not upon me because I am black because the sun has looked upon me. You remember the day you got saved by the grace of God? Boy, I remember at Fletcher First Baptist Church there in Fletcher, North Carolina, under the leadership of Pastor Roy Waldrop. I was sitting back about third stained glass window there at Fletcher. Boy, I mean, he got to preaching on the power of God that morning. I'll never forget it. I was, tell, I was sitting there, I was just asking him, boy, I can't wait for you just to, just to sort of hush up so I can go. I've never been to an old Baptist altar until that Sunday morning. Boy, when he said, let's stand, I come up out of that, old, out of that pew, come down to the left side of that altar. I felt nasty. I felt defiled. I felt drip just, I mean, I was just dark. I mean, I felt filthy. I felt everything. And boy, when I went down there and got saved, I stood up. I said, boy, there's something different about this. And ever since that day, amen, God didn't look at me after that point the way I used to be. Now he looks at me and says, there's my beautiful one. There's my fair one. There's my love, amen. There ain't but one like him, amen. And boy, there's sometimes it's just them terms of endearment and God speaks to his child I'm telling you he loved on me this morning inside that control room of WGCR oh it was getting tight boy I like it to hear the voice of compassion boy he does have that voice of compassion how do you get that voice and that how do you get beautiful well Psalms 149 says this in verse number 4 for the Lord takes pleasure in his people he shall beautify the meek with salvation how do you get beautiful in the eyes of God get saved all you got to do so we see the voice of compassion then secondly we see the voice of comfort he says in verse number 10 it says my beloved spake unto me and, and said rise up my love my fair one and come away for lo the winter is past the rain is, is over and gone boy it talks about the voice of comfort that rain and them storms talks about difficult times in life and boy I'm telling you there's difficult times on every hand I mean, we're living in a days of nothing but problems and discouragements and disappointments and dark valleys and, and everything we're going through. I mean, just take calls. I mean, I took a call from a preacher today was coming uh, uh, this afternoon. And he was talking to me and telling me about some things with his wife and the storms that she's going through and, the, and what she's been facing over the last eight to ten weeks. And it's really starting to weigh on him. And, and boy, he's really just going through a lot. And he told me, I'm tired, Preacher Jones. He says, I'm just wore out. He says, and he started to tell us about some of the things he's going through. And, and boy, I'm telling you, what he needs to hear is the voice of comfort. I'm telling you, there's going to be those times. But can I tell you, that's one thing you're going to have to start listening listening for when you get in those times of trouble and that time of discouragement those times of dark valleys that time of the shadow of death I'm telling you you can listen to God in them times of your life and he'll speak to you just like we see here when the when the disciples Lord I'm asking for your help tonight they're in the book of Mark chapter number 4 verse number 39 and the disciples were in the sea in the boat and they were there and they were being tossed with the waves and, and boy it was a terrible storm that come up on the sea of Galilee and they were experiencing 
salesmen. I mean, they knew what to do. They were mariners. They knew the Sea of Galilee like the back of their hand, but they were in a storm like they've never faced before. They couldn't row them wet their self out of that. They couldn't do anything like that. There may be somebody here tonight. You're facing a storm of your life. You're at your wit's end. You don't know what to do. Them disciples came to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm just going to paraphrase it. They said, Carest not that carest not that we perish. In other words, we're going to die out here if you don't do something, God. Boy, he looked up at them. He was still sitting down. He says, oh, yeah, little faith. He stood up and he rebuked the wind, which tells me it was a satanic storm. And he rebuked that wind and that, that sea and that wind. It all just settled down. Can I tell you, that's what you need is the voice of comfort. Boy, I remember one time, and it's been years ago, I was in Bible college at Anchor. And I was working at a job, and I lost my job. I worked for a plastic injection mold company. And China, they took all our jobs, and of course, mine went overseas. And I was in Bible college, and I went to Bible college at night and worked during the day. Well, I lost my job, and of course, money was getting tight. I had a young girl, I had a young child at that time. And of course, I believe the husband should be the, should be the keeper of the home, and I still believe that's still scriptural today. And I had my wife I was responsible for, my child I was responsible for, and money was getting tight, and every time I tried to fix it, it'd get worse. You ever tried to do that? And the more you tried to fix it, the worse it got. The more I tried to fix it, the worse I got. And I mean, I was really carrying a burden because I had a wife and a child, and I, I didn't have no money coming in, and bills were getting due, and things were starting to take place, and I mean, things were just rough, and I didn't know what to do. And boy, it was on a Tuesday night of Bible college, and I'll never forget it, and they come in there, and that first teacher come in there, and he says, open up your Bible and take her textbook, and that's exactly what we did, and that's as far as that teacher got. And God showed up after he says, open up your Bible and your textbook, and God showed up in a mighty way inside that classroom, and right, I mean, within 10 minutes of that class, and all of a sudden, that people were sprawled out praying, and I met Brother Youngblood, he was off to, to my right, and he was over there praying, and I just crawled underneath the table, them desks are still there in 205 at Anchor Baptist Church, and I can take you to the desk just about within a foot from where I was at, and I just crawled up underneath that desk. I laid out prostate underneath that desk, and I just got to that place, and I said, God, this is all I said. I said, Lord, I can't handle it no more. And I mean, that's all I said. I was at my wit's end. I was a crying that night. I was just needing something from God. It felt like God crawled up underneath that desk that night, put his arms around me. I, I just felt like I felt his arms wrap up around me that night. And he just said in that small, still voice, he says, this is what I've been waiting for. I've been waiting for you to call on me like this. He says, I've got it from here. If you just let her go. Boy, I'm telling you, I got up. God met with us for four hours that night we were in the holies of holies I didn't I didn't come out from underneath that desk for four hours that night God just loved on me just he took his time with me that night boy I'm telling you he's rubbing the ball of Gilead in my soul that night he was whispering sweet peace and sweet love down underneath that desk boy I needed it that night I was in a restful storm I was at my wits end all of a sudden God showed up and he says I've got it and I said well praise the Lord I got home that night I went and woke my wife up I believed it so much I went and woke her up I said honey I said God says he's got all this taken care of I said he's gonna take care of it amen did he oh yes he did boy he done more for me in them two weeks than God can explain here tonight but God I mean hey he just sort of just guided me through he got me a job that week that I didn't even apply for and just somebody come to me and says brother Jones I heard you're looking for a job I said boy am I ever looking for a job I went into that interview they interviewed me I mean they hired me they said you can start next week boy I'm telling you that week went on I started the following Monday I mean God did so much for me took care of my family met the bills paid everything that was and never wrote one bad check in the midst of that storm but I'm telling you it was nothing like God split up underneath that desk and whispered comfort to my soul telling you God has a voice of comfort <laughs> boy I think about Mary at the tomb <laughs> they're trying to figure out how they're gonna roll the stone away and boy I mean they were downtrodden distraught everything was going through their mind oh Jesus walked up behind her said Mary she thought he was just a lonely old gardener <laughs> Boy, all to a sudden, she said Mary, and something rolled around in her heart and says, I know that voice from somewhere. 
That ain't no gardener, amen. I'm telling you, she was discouraged. She was distraught. But boy, just the voice of God. She turned around and says, Rabboni, amen. I'm telling you, she went from a low to a high all because of the voice of God. Amen, I'm telling you. And the voice of comfort. Thirdly, we see the voice of calling away. It says, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Amen. Amen, I'm telling you. I'm about to shout, and I'm not even to the verses. Boy, I think about 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, and everybody probably could quote this verse, but I'm going to go read it because my mind ain't working like it should tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead of Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remaining shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Boy, John was in the spirit on the Lord's day and he wrote all them letters to them churches. But boy, you get to Revelations chapter number 4. And it says something like this. It says, come up hither, amen. Oh, John, he was caught up in the heavens, amen. Started writing down some things that's fixing to take place, amen. Boy, one of these days, there's going to be that calling and calling away, amen. And I got the bright idea in my, my bedroom, and we live in the country. I mean, you can't see my neighbor, even though I've got one. And I mean, you, well, we live where you can leave your blinds open. Say amen to that. I like it. And I got the bright idea, and I told my wife, I don't know what I was thinking, but I said, let's move our bed. I said, let's point it to the east. She said, what for? I said, well, if the Lord comes, I don't want to have to turn around. Say amen. So we did that. I don't know what I was thinking about a man moving furniture. That was stupid, stupid, because you never put the dresser in the right place. I bet you I moved that dresser and that chest of drawers I don't know how many times. I just wanted to move the bed. Boy, I'm telling you, I just wanted to turn it. Just, just place her to the east, amen. Well, we got that finally done. And one night in the middle of the night, all of a sudden we were sleeping, and, and uh, we live by the airport. But the planes always come west to east. They never come any other direction if they come towards my house. And it's in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden, my room lit up. And I live on a two-story house, so for my room to light up, it's a miracle. And all of a sudden, this bright light shined in in my room. Well, I shot up straight up out of the bed with my hands held up like this, and and I was doing this, and nothing was a happen. And uh, my wife, she started to finally come to and said, what's wrong? And I finally figured out the plane come from the other direction. Turned on a big floodlight and lit up my room like none other. And boy, I was mad that night. I said, nothing. I said, I thought the Lord was coming. And I said, now I'm disappointed and mad. It's not him. Old D.L. Moody's got a great message on heaven, a two-part message. And I've read it over and over again. It's beautiful. And inside that message, he was a chapel of a so for the soldiers war going on. And inside that place where he served was the, the place where these soldiers were mortally wounded. And that's where he served. And he just went through, and in that story on what he was saying is that it got quiet inside that that room that morning he says it was deathly quiet he says it was unusual he said there was no no death rattles there was no moaning there was no groaning he says an unusual morning and he was sitting there just silently going by man to man and he was praying over everyone and he said all to a sudden the silence was broken with this here here here, old D.L. Moody and that sergeant that was inside that room one, run to that boy and said, son, we're here, what's wrong? That old boy just said, here, here. Old D.L. Moody he got a hold of that boy and said, son, we're here, what's wrong? What's the matter? And that boy just kept calling, here, here. Old D.L. Moody said, son, we're here, what's wrong? And old D.L. Moody said, that boy finally come to and when he come to, he looked at old D.L. Moody. He says they were calling the roll up into heaven, and they just called my name. I was just saying here, amen, here, 
here, amen. And that boy just started to holler out, here, here. And his voice started to trail off, amen, until his final words. I'm telling you, we sing that song when the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there, amen. I'm telling you, one of these glorious days, God's going to call my name. I'm going to stand up and say, here, amen. Here, amen, I tell you. There's a voice of a call away. We're going to see our loved ones one day, Miss Coach. I'm telling you one day, because God's going to call us up out of here. Amen, I'm telling you. Boy, I can't wait to see Mom and Daddy. But most of all, I can't wait to see he- the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that saved me by His grace. I'm looking forward to that voice. Amen. Amen, I'm telling you. <laughs> There's a voice of a calling away. I need to hurry. There's a voice of certainty. Amen. A voice of certainty. What do you mean by that? Well, what God says, God means, amen. God, it seems like today in our Baptist churches, we think God's going to bend the rules because of who you are. Can I tell you, you're oh so wrong. God's not going to bend no rules for you just because of who you are or what church you belong to or what position you hold in this church, amen. But I'm telling you, God has some things that's written out, and the Bible still says, thou shalt not steal. Guess what it still means? Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. It still means today, thou shalt not commit adultery. But yet, we're still trying to see if we can get away with it. Matter of fact, we got such an epidemic in our Baptist churches on that very one about thou shalt not commit adultery. I'm telling you, we're bringing in our churches, amen. Amen. I'm telling you, my girls, (laughs) what daddy says, daddy means. Even a little pony. Amen. Daddy says you're getting a whipping. You're getting a whipping. I'm not one of these in Walmart. Now, Junior, if I get to five, you're getting a whipping. I've never done that. Not one time with any of my girls. Matter of fact, I never give them a countdown. Amen. I've whipped both of them. Amen. Don't get quiet on me. It's hard. I finally figured out what Mama's meant when she says it's going to hurt me worse than it hurts you. I finally figured that out. After you whip them, you go in a room and you cry. It's exactly what you do. But I'm telling you, what Daddy says, Daddy means. But can I tell you what God says, God means? He said some things in the Word of God that we're supposed to live by. Don't tie it, don't, don't, don't bog down on me. We're, we're going somewhere. But God's got some rules set out that God's not going to break for anybody. He says, we live holy for I am holy. Guess what? We're supposed to live holy. Live clean. Amen. If we'd start living clean, we'd have more revival than what we're having today. But we're bringing the filth and the junk in our churches and say, God bless our filth and junk. God's not going to bless filth and junk. God's just going to bless holiness. Amen. So we see that if there's a voice of certainty, Need to move on. I got two more points here. Uh, I've labored long each night. But then we see the voice of certainty. But I want you to take your Bible, but I want you to mark Song of Solomon chapter number two because we're going to come back. I want you to go to Matthew chapter number seven. Matthew chapter number seven. But we're going to come back to Song of Solomon chapter number two and we're going to finish this message. Matthew chapter number seven. And I know the book of Matthew is written to the Jews. But there's some spiritual application for us here today. And we see here in Matthew chapter number 7, it says in verse number 8, or 19, I'll start reading and then you all can catch up to me. Verse number 19 says, Every tree that bringeth forth not, or bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. But verse number 21 through 23 is where I want to go. It says, not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, before I get in this next point, this is one voice I will never hear. I'll never hear this 
voice. And that's the voice of condemnation. I am not condemned because I'm saved by the grace of God. And if in you are in here lost tonight, can I tell you, you are condemned. This is one voice right now that you are going to hear. Unless you get saved by the grace of God. We got a lot of people, and I'm not here to make you doubt your salvation. But we have a lot of people that are professing just his name. And they've got the head knowledge, but they lack the heart knowledge. And they're lacking 18 inches is what's separating you from heaven to hell. Is 18 inches. I was in a village above the Arctic Circle. We were staying in the, in the, the count, what was a, the tribal council's office. That's where we stayed. That's where we slept. And at 7 o'clock, we had to go there because it was a dangerous village to be in. And I had my wife and my two girls with me in this village. And the council told me after 7 o'clock, no later than 8, lock the door. I said, no problem. So we did. I was in that council's office, and they had a big billboard inside that office. And I started to read what was on that billboard, and they had a list. If I knew I was preaching this tonight, I'd have brought that list. Still got it. And they had a list of ten things to confirm your way into heaven. And I started to read that list, and I'm going to do some of them by memory. The first thing they had on there, they says, memorize the Ten Commandments. And I says, well, I'm for memorizing Scripture, but that don't get you into heaven. You can know John 3, 16 from beginning to end and end to beginning and can quote it backwards and it still won't get you into heaven. And they had write an essay on John 3, 16. It's what they had, a one-paragraph essay on John 3, 16. I said, well, that's pretty good. Most preachers can't preach on John 3, 16. And they had some other things, but on the bottom of that list, this is what they had. Visit a nursing home. And I says, why? So the nice, gentle, kind giant that I am waited till the next morning. And I waited for the tribal council to come in. And I said, sir, and I took their little piece of paper that they had written out, and I took it to them, and I laid it on their desk, and I said, "Um, question. I said, I was reading your list on how you said 10 ways to confirm your way into heaven. I said, y'all believe this? And they said, sure do. I said, "Uh, got a problem. I said, number 10, it says you need to visit a nursing home. I said, where's the nursing home? They said, we don't have one. I said, all right. I said, Second question, I says, the the young folks in this village, I says, y'all are poor, aren't you? They said, very poor. I said, out of all the people that you got living in this village, I said, how many of them are going to get on a plane and go to Fairbanks? He says, and he thought, because I had them and he knew it. He says, not many of them. I said, so what you're saying is that you doomed everybody to hell because they're never going to make it to a nursing home. I said, sir, it's going to be sad. They're going to do all nine and not feel number ten. I said, they're going to stand before God, and they're going to say this, have we not? Have we not? Boy, it got quiet in here tonight. I wonder who might be sitting in this congregation tonight trying to talk your way into heaven. Lord, I'm on the church roll. Lord, I went to revival every night. Lord, I put my money in the the offering. Lord, 10%, just like you said. Lord, I, I, I went to Sunday school. Lord, I, I, I told people about you. Lord, I, 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 I've done this and, 
And boy, I'm telling you, we're raising a bunch of people in our Baptist churches of just nothing but have we not. There may be somebody in here tonight, you're saying, you might be one of them, have we not. And you're trying to justify your way into heaven by what you're doing. Re re the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is not do, do, do. That's what most religions are. You got to do this. You got to do that. I was raised Catholic. I done told you all that. And I went to a Catholic camp one summer because that's the way I was raised. And there was a so-called nun that was there that was teaching us, and I never forgotten it. And she had a rock in her shoe. And she says, and, and, and she told us, all of us, she says, I've got a rock in my shoe. And she says, it's painful, but it gets me closer to God. And I look back at that, and I'm like, no, it doesn't. It just gets you a hurt foot. It didn't get you no closer to God at all. And there's people just like her sitting in our Baptist churches doing the very same thing. And you're dying. And you're going straight to the pit of hell. God is going to put his finger in your face. You're going to see his glory and his holy glow. And that's the last thing you're going to remember when he kicks you off in the lake of fire. I believe you're going to see his glory shine through the holes in the hands. And he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. That rich man's still in hell. Go to my brother. Tell him, listen. Oh, don't rely on what I had. My money sent me to hell. Oh, it didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't work. And God is condemning you tonight. But you don't have to. Why don't you trade in this one voice for these other voices, amen? The voice of compassion. The voice of comfort. The voice of a calling away. I'm telling you, God loves you tonight. Oh, he loves you tonight. Oh, he went to the cross of Calvary for you so you wouldn't have to hear this voice. You know who you are. There's somebody in here tonight you need to get saved. And I felt it when I walked in. Oh, I don't know what to do. Let me hit this last point and I'm done. I don't, I, I don't want to mess up what God's doing. Song of Solomon, chapter number 2. I'll hit this briefly and I'm quitting, Brother Coates. And my pianist, if you'd come, please come to the piano right now. He says here in verse number 14, he says, Let me hear thy voice. For as sweet is thy voice, thy countenance is comely. Oh, how are you going to get to know somebody? And I won't labor this because somebody's under conviction. I feel it within my soul. God wants to save you tonight. But how do you get to know somebody's voice? It was just like my wife when I picked her up and took her on our first courting date. I talked to her and she talked to me and we found out what her likes and dislikes were. Oh, but when I recognized her voice, I can recognize it in a crowd. That's how I get to know her. And boy, it talks about there in the book of John. It says, my sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow. Oh, if you'll stay close to him, you won't follow that stranger's voice. Oh, I'm telling you. Somebody, God's calling you. Somebody needs to get saved. Let us stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed.